Hello and welcome to St. Andrews, where we are a community of faith united by the love of Jesus Christ, building disciples through worship, study, prayer, and service. Let's open with a word of prayer. Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. Incline my ear to your words and let your speech come to me as dew upon the grass. If I hear your voice, let me not be condemned for hearing the word and not following it, for knowing it and not loving it for believing it and not living it. Speak then, Lord, for your servant listens, for you have the words of eternal life. Speak to me to the comfort of my soul and to change my whole life. In turn, may it give you praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the first chapter of the book of Daniel. Listen for God's word. In the third year of the rule of Judah's king Jehoi Jehoiakim, Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and attacked it. The Lord handed Judah's king Jehoiakim over to Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the equipment from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar took these to Shinar, to his own God's temple, putting them in his God's treasury. Nebuchadnezzar instructed his highest official, Ashpenaz, to choose royal descendants and members of the ruling class from the Israelites, good-looking young men without defects, skilled in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, conversant with learning and capable of serving in the king's palace. Aspenaz was to teach them the Chaldean language and its literature. The king assigned these young men daily allotments from his own food and from the royal wine. Ashpenaz was to teach them for three years, so that at the end of that time they could serve before the king. Among these young men from the Judeans were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the chief official gave them new names. He named Daniel Belshazzar, Hananiah Shadrach, Mishael Meshach, and Azariah Abednego. Daniel decided that he wouldn't pollute himself with the king's rations or the royal wine and he appealed to the chief official in hopes that he wouldn't have to do so. Now God had established faithful loyalty between Daniel and the chief official, but the chief official said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my master, the king, who has mandated that you are to eat what you are to eat and drink. What will happen if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men in your group? The king will have my head because of you. So Daniel spoke to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Why not test your servants for ten days? You could give us a diet of vegetables to eat and water to drink, then compare our appearance to the appearances of the young men who eat the king's food. Then deal with your servants according to what you see. The guard decided to go along with their plan and tested them for ten days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard kept taking away their rations and the wine they were supposed to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And God gave knowledge, mastery of all literature and wisdom to these four men. Daniel himself gained understanding of every type of vision and dream. When the time came to review the young men as the king had ordered, the chief official brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. When the king spoke with them, he found no one as good as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they took their place in the king's service. Whenever the king consulted them about any aspect of wisdom and understanding, he found them head and shoulders above all the dream interpreters and enchanters in his entire kingdom. And Daniel stayed in the king's service until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So does God want you to be a vegetarian? Now that's a provocative sermon title, isn't it? And we begin our six-week series on the book of Daniel this morning. It's a book that will provoke us and prompt us to ask questions if we will let it. But before we get into the vegetarianism, let's go into just a smidgen of the background. The first half of the book of Daniel follows the experiences of four Jews who were taken captive and brought to Babylon. This was a trying time for the Israelite people because they had been defeated by an outside power, 
The temple had been destroyed, and many of the most skilled and learned people had been taken from Jerusalem into exile in Babylon, carted off to serve a foreign government in a foreign land. Many of the books of the Hebrew Scriptures were written in or influenced by this time period, and echoes of the exile experience are heard throughout Scripture. So with the backdrop of political, social, and theological upheaval, we meet Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These, along with an unknown number of other young men, were selected because they were intelligent, capable, physically fit, and good-looking. Those were the requirements. Those were the entry requirements for entering what we could call the King's College. This group of young, handsome men were educated in the ways, languages, customs, and scholarships of the, of the Babylonians. And as students, part of the perk was that their room and their board was taken care of by the king. And we don't know exactly why Daniel and the other three refused to eat the king's rations. Some scholars say that there was a concern about the way that any meat was prepared, whether it met the dietary restrictions of the Jews. But others say that there was nothing that would prevent the men from at least enjoying the king's or anyone's wine. So there's nothing in the text to indicate the reason behind Daniel's refusal of the king's food and wine. We're only told that Daniel decides to do this, and he does. So he convinces the guard in charge of him and his three friends to give them a trial run of only eating vegetable waters, so vegetable and water. So for 10 days, this trial will run, and we're probably all familiar with that trial run tactic. It seems easier to commit to something for the short term. After all, there's little to lose. I remember learning about the power of the trial run when I was a kid, and my sister and I convinced our parents to take in a dog on a trial run. Well, that trial run lasted for 18 years. For a period of 10 days, Daniel and his crew, they eat only vegetables, drink only water, they refuse the king's rich food, and at the end, they look healthier than all the other students. So the moral of the story is we should all become vegetarians and swear off wine, right? After all, the scripture says that God gave knowledge, mastery of all literature and wisdom to these four men. Daniel himself gained understanding of every type of vision and dream. I don't think that this blessing from God was because of the content of their meals. You see, these young men have found themselves in a place where they have very little control over their lives. They are told what they will study, what they will do, and they are told what they will eat. And in that, Daniel sees one way, one way in which he can show resistance. Whether this resistance stemmed from an early version of the kosher dietary laws or just a way to draw a line and say that the king cannot tell him what he will do with his own body. It's a way for Daniel and his friends to say that the space of their bodies was in their control and not under the control of a foreign king or his guards. There's a lot about the action of God in this passage, and we'll see this continue as we journey through the next six chapters over the next six weeks. Though the character, characters of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah will stand in the foreground, there is an undercurrent of God's action and God's giving that permeates the whole book. God gives to Daniel and his friends the abilities they need to find favor with the king and sets them up in a prominent place. And what they will do with that prominent, prominent place we will see as God continues to guide their work and their lives in exile. So, what makes these four so special? Why does God favor them? We've already talked about how it wasn't because of their dietary choices, since there is no link or indication that God favored them or even, even noticed them because of their choice not to eat the king's rations. So we are left to wonder, why did God show favor to these four? 
And the only conclusion we can draw is that they were gifted by God with knowledge and skills because of God's grace. They were pointed out and selected not because they were more faithful than others, more skilled or more handsome than the other men in exile. They were just gifted with God's grace. And though these men's stories are written as hero stories, the true mover in these stories is God. At God's grace, every step of the way guides them, provokes them, and pursues these young men. They are living in a land where they must navigate living in a culture different from the one of their childhood. They must discern daily what their reaction will be to the pressures of living and working in a foreign land. They must decide where they will draw the line. As they did with the refusal of the king's rations, they must be willing to say that there are certain parts of their lives that will not be allowed to be under the control of others. They will have to decide what is their core, the core of their belief in God. As we continue to follow these three men and their service in the royal court, we'll begin to see a pattern of them using the gifts of God's grace in their work. Now you may be wondering what these events that took place over 2,500 years ago have to do with us today. You may just be questioning if Emily is just taking us on a journey through a bunch of Bible stories that, while nice to know, really have no impact upon our life today. After all, what does it matter today that Daniel and his friends found favor with God? What does it matter that they refused the king's rations, stayed healthy, and gotten in good with the king? I invite you to do a trial run. Try out the book of Daniel with me for three weeks. And if you still think that there is nothing in there that applies to your life today, then I give you complete and total permission to tune me out for the last three weeks of this series. So what do you say? Will you give it a trial run? Will you listen for God's word to speak to you in this time and in this place? I pray you will. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you with the concerns that weigh upon our hearts and on our minds. We pray, Holy God, for our world, that you would touch it with healing and wash it clean from all violence, pollution, and corruption, that the whole earth may be full of your glory. We pray, loving God, for loved ones, that you would embrace each one of us as your beloved children. Hold us in your arms and give us a sense of your wholeness. We pray for our communities and places of connection, May our communities be places of peace and justice. Guide us to care for those in need, those in need of shelter, in need of food, in need of safety, in need of mental or physical health care. Lead us, God, to reach out in your name. And gracious God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we are grateful for those who gave their lives in hope of worldly peace and unity among humanity. Their service came not only at the cost of their future, but dramatically changed the lives of their families and loved ones as well. With thankful hearts, we ask that you inspire each of us to use our gifts, our times, our talents and treasure to bring unity in the midst of diversity and to proclaim and live out your peace that transcends the challenges of this current age. We pray all this in the powerful name of Christ. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.